All right, we've talked about the concept of grid search now, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time in Scikit-Learn playing with the built-in grid search capabilities. We'll also spend a bit of time working on uh, some graphics as well. I provided a, the skeleton for this code. It's essentially the same as what we uh, had for our regularization conversation. I've added a few other components, some color map components. There's uh, also, of course, the, the grid search uh, CV component uh, that you'll want to be loading up. But otherwise, everything is the same. I've already executed all of these things, so I'm going to drop down uh, to the, the bottom here. Um, so the grid search CV mechanism that is provided by Scikit-Learn is very cool in the sense that it uh, will take an arbitrary model as input and uh, perform learning uh, with that particular model. And so this is one of the powers of having a very uh, consistently defined uh, interface for all of our learning models. So first up, uh, we've already selected out the shoulder position, the M1 data. We're doing, of course, all of our training with just one fold. And we first off need to define which type of model we're going to use. I'm going to use the ridge regression model. Um, in this case, I'm not providing a, a parameter right now. This is the, the alpha parameter, if you recall, is the regularization parameter. Um, this is something that's going to be filled in by the grid search process. All right, next up, we also need to define what values we want to use for, uh, for grid search. And uh, this provides, we, we provide a list of hash maps or dictionaries. Each dictionary expresses one grid search. So, so in this particular case, there is only one parameter with ridge regression, and I'm going to uh, specify a, an exponential set of uh, values for, uh, for alpha. So there's 10,000. Okay. And then we've defined the grid search mechanism itself. And that takes as input our model that we've defined, the parameters. And since we want to be doing cross-validation, I'm going to go ahead and uh, set cross-validation to 20. And for scoring, I'm going to go ahead and define, zoom this out just a little bit, I'm going to define uh, negative uh, mean squared error. So, so uh, in, in this particular case, we, we want to generally be minimizing mean squared, squared error. Uh, the grid search mechanism wants to maximize a, what, whatever the uh, metric is. So we take the negative of, of that. And uh, I missed a fine param grid there. Sorry about that. Okay, so we now define grid search. And, and now we can tell it to fit our ins and outs. This took about 10 seconds or so to execute on my laptop. Uh, we got a report back of uh, what has been filled in for this particular object. Um, and of course, one of the first things we want to do is look at, uh, look at the best choice of parameters. Of course, there's only one. Uh, and what it has come back and said is 1,000. If you recall from our previous work with ridge regression, we kind of narrowed down to about 500, which is uh, which of of the set here, a thousand is closest to that. So, the, so, uh, so it's doing nominally what we uh, wanted it to do. So next up, let's set ourselves up to do a little bit of visualization. I'm going to extract the statistics for uh, for each of the uh, grid cells within our grid search. And that particular property is uh, CD results. And in fact, um, actually, before we do visualization, uh, it turns out CV results is uh, formatted such that we could actually uh, create a 
data frame from this. So let's let's do that. Of course, we get sort of getting into deprecation land here. Um, Uh, this has to do with which metrics we're actually referencing at, at this point in time. We're not so worried about that, but uh, we can actually look at this uh, data frame that we've gotten back here. Uh, and uh, so, so each one of the rows here is one particular choice of parameter combinations. It's one grid cell. So you can see there, are, there's some statistics about training time. There's uh, some statistics about uh, the test and the train score, and then param alpha, there's there's our parameter right there. You can also get the parameters in a uh, form of uh, a dictionary. And then the scores are off to the, uh, the right-hand side here. Um, you'll notice it says uh, split zero, train and test score. Uh, implied here is also, so, so there are a whole bunch of missing columns in this display, but we can also, there's also split one, split two, et cetera. So these are the different rotations in our cross-validation uh, process. What's not shown here is that there is also a column that corresponds to the, the mean test and training scores. You can see, uh, off on the far right hand side, you can see that there are standard deviations that are being expressed. There's, there's also mean that we can get to. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and, and access those means uh, directly here. So I'm gonna pull out scores. I'm gonna go right back to the uh, stats dictionary. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a, an array of uh, root mean squared errors. So mean test uh, score will uh, is is the uh, the element in the in the stats dictionary that that we're looking for. We have one statistic for every alpha because it was the negative mean squared error. I'm uh, taking the negative of that and then. Uh, computing the square root of that. So we can look at those scores there. There's our uh, set of values. And, and you can see it, it starts out high, it drops down, and then begins to go back up. But let's go ahead and uh, visualize this. At this point, this is a pretty standard process for what you've uh, been doing. And we'll plot that in green. Oh, of course, PLT. So my error here was that I hadn't defined this variable alphas. Uh, let me go ahead and extract that also from our uh, return state. Um, so this is a dictionary. I'm pulling out uh, the param alpha element of the dictionary. And underneath that is, is actually a, uh, a structure. So, so I'm pulling out the data element of that structure. So uh, that gives us uh, this uh, figure here, uh, and and this matches what we were seeing in terms of the numbers. We had this very high error uh, to for, for a very small alpha, and then that dropped down as we increased alpha, uh, and then continuing to increase alpha, we, we see an increase in the parameters. The, this is a, a nice place to be as far as uh, exploration goes. We really want this minimum value here to not be on an edge. We want it to actually be somewhere in the middle of the range that we're searching. If, if we find it on the edge, then that really tells us that we ought to be extending the range that we're looking for. Okay, next, what we'd like to do is try to do a little bit more focused uh, search. I'm gonna set this up in a way that's a little bit more generic uh, as far as search goes. Uh, so, so we're uh, gonna do uh, exponential search with a base of 10, that's what we did before. Um, but I want not uh, the, the few steps that we had, the six or so steps that we had, I want actually 20 steps. And I'm going to top this out at, um, 
math.log. So, so we were searching up to 10,000. So I'm, I'm just asking what uh, 10,000 is in base 10, the, the log of that. And my exponents then become uh, from zero to top and then top divided by step. And I forgot a G there. So this, uh, this arrange function here, this is like the range function, uh, except it actually allows us to, to do uh, floating point values. Uh, the range function itself only get, allows us to work in integers. Okay, so finally, I can compute my set of alphas. Okay, so EXPs is, is the set of exponents that I care about, and I'm just building an array uh, of, uh, of alphas uh, for whatever base we've defined raised to our exponents. And steps, there we go. And so, the, so there's a, a new set of alphas. There are 20 of them that range nominally from one up to 10,000. And, and, but these are regular steps in, in log space. Okay, so now let's go ahead and set up an, our new experiment. Our, our param grid now is, is going to reference this variable that we've defined. And then we'll set up our grid search. And we'll still use our scoring of negative mean squared error. And let me show you one other uh, useful parameter. Uh, in jobs, uh, this tells uh, Python how many uh, CPUs or cores that it should be using in order to execute this grid search CV. So, so these are very uh, parallelizable. Uh, th this is a very parallelizable kind of a task, uh, and uh, this forces uh, Python to go out and, and use uh, up to five cores. So, so it should execute relatively quickly. All right, once we create the grid search component there, we need to do, make sure we do our fit and execute that. My keyboard has been dropping keys on me here. All right, so now we're executing. That will take a, a moment since we're doing a, a wider search than we were before. Okay, so that, that took about uh, 15, 20 seconds or so to uh, execute, next thing to do is to pull out uh, the statistics and, and the scores for the test data, and then to go ahead and, and plot the results. I'm gonna do the plotting in just a slightly different way than usual, so that we have a bit more control over how things are shown. That is the same. Uh, I'm going to explicitly pull out the, the axis within the figure. So remember that we can have multiple axes within uh, figures. Uh, I want to be able to address this, this axis uh, by setting its scale. So, so since our alphas are, uh, are, are uh, exponentially arranged, I want to do a, a log scale for the horizontal axis here. And, and there we go. So, uh, so as you can see, uh, we're, we weren't quite hitting 10 to the, 10 to the four, uh, but the minimum here seems to be sitting somewhere uh, in this vicinity here, which is actually not too far off from our 500 that we, uh, that we found. So this is 100 here, two, three, four, Five, actually the best seems to be somewhere around 600 or so, just eyeballing this figure. Okay, so, so now that we have 
uh, establish nominally where this minimum is. Uh, what I'd like to do is focus our search a little bit more uh, in say this range, 10, 10 to the two, uh, up to, probably up to about here. And, and I'm gonna go from a, a, a factors of 10 search to a factors of two search so we get a bit finer granularity. So, so the way I'm going to accomplish that is just to go back up to the uh, top uh, up here and switch our base over to, to two, keep the uh, 20 steps, and let's also define the bottom of our search. And I, I want the bottom to be at an alpha of uh, 100. So I'm just computing the log of that automatically here. Let's go ahead and narrow the top down to say 2000. And, uh, and then we'll compute the exponents. Uh, the bottom now, instead of being at an exponent of zero, is now going to be the, our bottom that we've defined. Uh, we're going to go to the top and steps are going to be of size uh, top minus bottom divided by number of steps. Our exponents are going to be, uh, the steps of our exponents are going to be this. OK, so there we, there we go. I executed that. Let's look at the alphas. You can see now I'm, I'm running nominally from 100 to uh, 1721. Uh, and we have regular steps in, in, the, uh, in the factor of two sets. And now go ahead and execute what we already have uh, implemented. That will take again a moment to uh, execute. OK, that took us about 15, 20 seconds or so to uh, execute. And let's go ahead and uh, revisualize uh, this. So there we go. So now we're, we're nominally working in this range of uh, 10 to the 2 uh, out to 10 to the 3 times 2. Uh, and and a, we're getting a, a more clear picture as to where the, the bottom of that bowl is. Three, four, five, right? and, and the bottom seems to sit there right about at uh, an alpha of 600. So, so what we discovered before uh, is pretty consistent. If I remove this log scale uh, from the figure, I just wanted to show you what that uh, looks like. Uh, it's much more uh, skewed now because uh, we're not in that log space. Uh, and you can see actually a little bit more clearly with the axis labeling that, that our, the bottom of the, uh, the well here is, is sitting about 600. But one thing that is nice is that we've got a, a reasonable range of values of this alpha parameter for which we're performing essentially equivalently. OK, so let's, let's go ahead and move on to uh, something that has more than one parameter. And let's do that with uh, elastic net. Copied in some code to give us our range of alphas and a range of L1 ratios. So these are the two parameters for our elastic net. I've, I've gone back to a base 10, and we're again nominally going from 1 to 2,000. Is that, that's the, the range of alpha values. And here I'm just doing a linear sampling of the possible L1 values. Let's look at both of those. So there are, are our alphas. So one up to 935. And our L1 ratios look like this. So, uh, so remember, this is low end. This is the high end. And uh, this is the step. Actually, um, the high end is exclusive. So let's actually go all the way out to one. So, so that we, we get that 0.9 out over here. All right, so now our model is not going to be ridge regression, but an elastic net. And as before, I'm not specifying any parameters uh, explicitly when we're declaring that, that new elastic net object. Our param grid now has a dictionary with um, multiple with multiple elements in it. And uh, our grid search mechanism actually 
uses these names here to create the values for the parameters that are being uh, set within elastic net. So, so these actually have to match the parameters uh, used by the object. Okay. And let's go ahead and create our grid search. Again, we're using a negative mean squared error. And I'm going to set n jobs again to five here. Actually, I will set it to six for symmetry sake. And then grid search, we have to do our fitting. My goodness. All right, grid search.fit. There we go. All right, so this is going to take a moment to actually execute. All right, that took my laptop about one minute to uh, execute this. And the first thing we want to do is look at what it thinks is the best set of parameters. So, so here uh, it's chosen an alpha of one and an L1 ratio of 0.1. What this, what, what's interesting about this particular selection is that uh, this is on the edge actually of both of our parameters. So L1 ratios, there's our 0.1 right there and our alphas, wow, is, are right there. Um, it's chosen edge values for both of those parameters. So this suggests that we're actually not looking in the right uh, region whatsoever for an appropriate set of parameters. Now, if you recall uh, comparing ridge regression against lasso, lasso has that L1 norm. It actually wanted an alpha quite a bit smaller, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three kind of a range. So, and, and we're really searching in alphas that uh, were much more appropriate for ridge regression that uses the L2 norm. So let's expand our, our search here, or just our search. I'm just going to do that by going back up to the top here. Um, now the bottom, let's set that. Let's set this to, um, I'm just going to set this to uh, directly to negative four. So, so we're going to start our search at 10 to the minus four. And the top, I'm going to go ahead and trim some uh, off, the, off the top there. So let's go out to an alpha of 100. L1 ratios, I'm not going to really adjust that because we can't really go much beyond the zero to, zero to one are really our options there. So here is our new set of alphas. And actually uh, for giggles, let's set our steps to 20. So we have uh, 20 of those to work with. So we're going from uh, 10 to the minus four all the way out to 50. Uh, essentially in factors of 10 here. Okay, so now, now let's go ahead and create our new grid search and execute that. And since this is, uh, the search is, uh, a, is bigger, we're using essentially twice the number of parameters. We, we went from searching 10 alphas to 20 alphas. So that's going to make this uh, grid search to uh, be a, a bit more expensive. That execution took a few minutes. And now let's ask what the best parameters are. And now uh, we have an L1 ratio of 0.8, which is safely within the L1 ratios list, and an alpha of 0 0.003, which is, so we need to see the more recent alphas, which, which is safely within the, uh, the, the range of values that we're actually testing. Okay, so we feel a little bit better about uh, this particular choice. What we'd like to be able to do is, uh, is actually visualize uh, this set of results so that we get a better picture of the, the shape of the surface that we're actually dealing with here. And by surface, what I mean is uh, what is our root mean squared error as a function of our choice of alpha and of our choice of L1 ratio. 
So let's go ahead and set that up. So first off, I want to uh, get access to our various statistics. Um, let's see. Let's go ahead and pull out from the stat structure our param one ratio. That error came from the fact that I hadn't uh, properly defined stats. So we're pulling out CD results. Let's pull out our L1s and let's take a quick look at those. So this is one long array of uh, all of the L1 values that were used. And there's one element of this array for every, uh, co every combination of L1s and alphas. So you'll notice uh, we have 0, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to 0 0.9, and then we repeat again. And, and that's because we've moved on to the other, uh, to the alphas. So um, I actually want to express this in terms of a, a grid of values. So let me go ahead and reshape this. And uh, this vector can be reshaped. Uh, we have our alphas and our L1s. OK, so, so we've now reshaped this, this vector into a 2D, 2D matrix. And now you'll, you'll notice that we have uh, one uh, element of this matrix, one row of this matrix is uh, a course, corresponds to our range of different alpha values. Uh, I'm sorry, corresponds to our different L1 values. The next row is, is, is the repeat of that, etc. cetera. So, so the key here is that we got this, uh, this reshape uh, correct. We can do the same for the alphas. We'll pull out the stats, param alpha, and look at those values. And what we expect those to be is a, is a repeat for the first row, and then a repeat of uh, the next alpha value for the next row, and on down the line. OK, so, so we're capturing properly the, the, the different uh, combinations of alphas and, and and L1s. What we really want to get at are our root mean squared errors. Yes. And that is it's the same uh, process. So we're going to pull out, uh, we're going to do a little bit more work here. Uh, we're going to, we have to uh, compute the square root. about the mean test score. We're taking the inverse of that. We're computing uh, the square root of that. And now let me remove. Um, so, so the result of this is going to be one NumPy array. Uh, it's a one-dimensional vector. We're, we're reshaping it in the same way that we've reshaped the other two structures. OK, so now RMSEs now is a two-dimensional array. OK, so, so that's a fairly big array. Let's, let's go about uh, plotting this. And I'm going to do this uh, again, uh, pulling out the axis as we create the figure. Actually, I'm going to create the figure in a, yet another way. Uh, plot dot subplots uh, returns a, a tuple of a figure and the the first axis. Oops. So I am show stands for image show. So so since RMS ES is a uh, two-dimensional um, is a matrix. Um, we can pretend it's an, actually an image. And I'm going to 
set the C map to jet. Um, so, so each element of this of this grid or this uh, of this image has a continuous value, and uh, what the color map does is it maps values on onto some color to display in each of the grid cells. And I'm choosing one particular uh, one particular color map called Jet, which it does a good job of highlighting the differences between high and low values. All right, so we can we can actually execute this other than my oops ax dot im show. So so there is a uh, a range of values. Um, this is a, figures a little bit. This figure is a little bit hard to read um, because uh, we don't really know what these axes are. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time. Uh, building up some other code to uh, to make that cleaner. So let's go ahead and do this. So first off, I want to set the x ticks x ticks so so the the horizontal axis here corresponds to our L1 ratios. And, and all that these two lines are doing is uh, forcing us to put a tick mark for every, uh, for every column and every row. And now we want to set X tick label. And I'm going to, I'm not going to uh, plot, uh, we're not, we're, what we're going to do is use the X tick labels, the actual values for alpha, but I don't want to use infinite precision for that. Uh, instead, we're going to round these values up. And NumPy provides a, a, a function called around, which acts like rounding, but uh, you can uh, specify how many digits that you want. So uh, let's use L1 ratios. So remember that that's our list of L1 values. And we're going to go out to four digits. And we'll do the same for Y tick labels. Except we'll take alphas. So L1 ratio along the horizontal axis and along the vertical axis is our alphas. So let's try executing that. So that's rather ugly. Uh, let's work on cleaning this up uh, a little bit. Um, so, so all of our text is run together down along the, the, the horizontal axis. And our text is kind of running into itself uh, along here. So let's uh, let's clean that up. So first off, what I'm going to do is uh, for the plot, I'm going to set a property called uh, get x tick labels. Oh, we're, we're going to extract the x tick labels uh, from this particular axis. And then we're going to set their their uh, a property called rotation to 45 degrees. Horizontal alignment we'll set to right, and rotation mode we'll set to anchor. I encourage you to look uh, look those up. Let's execute that. Oh, of course, of course. It, requires us to spell rotation correctly. There we go. All right, so we're a, a little bit uh, closer now. Things are still run together a bit. Uh, let me take one more step here. OK, I'm going to do a couple of different things here. First off, I'm going to increase the figure size. And, uh, and then I'm also going to set the font size 
uh, to something smaller for both of our axis labels here. And okay, so there, there we have a, a, a nicer looking uh, figure. Okay, so, so looking at this um, the, in the jet color map, dark blue is the smallest value. Lighter blue gets uh, are, are higher, somewhat higher values. And by the time we get out to this red point here, that corresponds to the, the highest value. Um, uh, I am show actually automatically scales the range of uh, values uh, to the color map. So, so the lowest of the values that occur in the matrix uh, correspond to the dark blue and the highest corresponds to the, the, the dark red. Um, but you can see uh, down the middle here, there's this channel uh, that uh, is pretty clear. So what the grid search arrived at here was that uh, it liked uh, the, the L1 ratio of 0.8 which is sitting right here, and a value of alpha to be at 0 0.0032. So, so even though all of these look very dark, uh, the lowest point is this point right here. All right, so let's, let's try and zoom in a bit more into this area here and get a better sense of what the right uh, answer is. And the way I'm going to do that is just go back into our code and uh, make a modification to the ranges. So first off, I'm going to make a choice of, instead of working in base 10, I'm gonna work in uh, uh, base two here, I'll set the bottom to negative 10, and the top up to uh, two. We'll leave our L1 ratios the same. So here's our alphas. Before we were at 0 0.0039 or so, um, so somewhere hiding around in there, um, but, but our alphas now are uh, quite a bit more focused in, in terms of the values that we're looking at. L1 ratio stay the same, and now I'm now let's go ahead and execute our elastic net and, and the grid search. And this will take uh, a few minutes. Okay, again, that took several minutes to execute. Let's ask what uh, the best parameters are for this. So we're at an L1 ratio of 0.1 and an alpha of 0.02. So we're on the edge of our L1 ratio. Uh, but let's go ahead and look at the results here. Pull out the statistics and build the figure. Okay, so. So it should be clear that we sort of zoomed in on that region that was uh, of great interest. Uh, we're now at uh, the ideal point is at an L1 ratio of 0.1 and an alpha of uh, in, in this vicinity right here. So what, what this really tells us from the last uh, grid search was that this, this channel that sits in here these values are, these performance values are very similar to one another. We just happen to be sitting now uh, right at uh, this uh, L1 ratio of 0.1. All right, so one of the other type takeaways though of this uh, discovery of uh, this preferred L1 ratio is, is that we could imagine trying to drop this L1 ratio down even further. Not, we're not very far away from having an L1 ratio of zero and that particular choice uh, corresponds to uh, in the elastic net to having a, a us focused entirely on that L2 metric and uh, and not focused at all on the L1 metric. So so that's actually equivalent to using ridge regression rather than uh, rather than some some sort of a mixture of uh, L1 and L2. So so in the end, probably something that we've learned from this particular analysis is that. Uh, at least for this particular data set, uh, that the L1, uh, the, that the L2 metric and ridge regression are really probably the way to go. And, and that will actually simplify our, our search since we only have one parameter to work with. All right, so there, there are a few hints about doing grid search. 
in uh, scikit-learn and doing a tiny bit of uh, visualization. And hopefully you got a little bit out of that matplot uh, lib um, magic that we were doing right at the end to, to make things uh, happen, like turning the, uh, these by 45 degrees. Uh, and next up, it's finally time to uh, do some work with our holistic uh, cross-validation method.